Our subject today is a chosen prophet <clears throat> and his choice portrait of a chosen people. Today's Torah reading undergirds a core theological conviction shared by many, but not all Christians and Messianic Jews. This conviction is the uniqueness of God's dealings with the Jewish people. As we go into this today, we need to bear in mind that the other nations have also been on God's mind from the beginning of his dealings with the Jewish people. This is why when he called Abram, he said, I will make of you a great nation and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. But as the text reminds us, the Jewish people are the foundational people through whom blessing is distributed by a gracious God to a world which he created according to his own will. Let's look for a few minutes at the prophecies of Bil'am and how they reflect God's determination to make his blessing of the Jewish people to be the foundation of his goodness to all the families of the earth. Bilam gives four prophetic words about Israel, which remain true today. First, God determined that the Jewish people would be a unique, a distinct people. Bilam says, these are a people that will dwell alone and not think itself one of the nations. He goes on to say, who has counted the dust of Yaakov or numbered the ashes of Israel? May I die as the righteous die. May my end be like theirs. God determined that the Jewish people would be a unique people. Secondly, Bilam's second point is that Israel's chosenness and blessedness is the work of God and not man. One can't put a spell on Yaakov. No magic will work against Israel. It can now be said of Yaakov, what is this that God has done? Here is a people rising up like a lioness, like a lion, he rears himself up. He will not lie down until he eats up the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. When I was a teenager, I used to be embarrassed when people spoke of the Jews as the chosen people. It seemed chauvinistic and proud to me, but I am no longer embarrassed because the choice was not the Jewish people's choice, nor any other people's choice. It was God's choice. The chosenness and blessedness of Israel is the work of God and not of man. The third, Bilam's third point, is a repetition of something God told Abram back in the beginning of this people. Blessed be all who bless you. Cursed be all who curse you. God not only blesses this people, he rewards or punishes those who either bless or curse them. This doesn't mean that the Jewish people get a free pass from God. God is not interested in spoiling us. Israel has suffered in, his, in history much, especially because of her unique chosenness. This is why God can say to Amos, Amos, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. This is why Tevya. Uh, sorry, just a moment. Oh, didn't we get Tevya? Uh, I thought I had Tevya up here. It's okay. This is why Tevya can say and fit her on the roof. I know. I know. We are your chosen people. But once in a while, can't you choose somebody else? With unique chosenness comes unique responsibility. But other nations bear additional responsibility also because of Israel, because 
he either rewards or punishes those who bless or curse her. Finally, in the fourth point, Bil'am prophesies a mysterious figure, the Messiah, who will arise in Israel to be our ultimate victorious leader. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not soon. A star will step forth from Yaakov. A scepter will arise from Israel to crush the corners of Moab and destroy all the descendants of Shet. His enemies will be his possessions. Again, I must emphasize that God is not interested in spoiling Israel and in giving her a free pass. We as a people have suffered more for our sins than it is proper to say. But still, those who hate Israel because they are God's people are really hating the God who chose Israel for his own glory. At the end of all things, the Messiah himself will be manifest as Israel's great defender and warrior king. When the nations of the earth at the end of time have amassed themselves against God, his people, and his Messiah, and when all the nations of the earth shall look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, it will be Yeshua, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and Messiah of Israel, before whom they will tremble. A few verses before our Haftorah begins, the prophet Micah, Micha, echoes the prophecy of Bil'am about the Messiah. And he says, <clears throat> But you, Bethlehem, near Ephrat, so small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come forth to me the future ruler of Israel, whose origins are far in the past, back in ancient times. And he goes on to say, Therefore, he will give up Israel only until she who was in labor gives birth. Then the rest of his kinsmen will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and feed his flock in the strength of Adonai, in the majesty of the name of Adonai, his God. And they will stay put as he grows great to the very ends of the earth. And this will be our shalom. What an incredible prophecy about the coming of Messiah, which refers back to this ancient prophecy of Bilam. I see him, but not now. A scepter, a star shall rise in Jacob, and a scepter shall rise up. So what should we do, especially what should we Jews do with all of this? How shall we respond to the magnificent privilege of chosenness, of blessedness, uniqueness, and protection by the hand of Almighty God and our victorious Messianic King? This is an important question. Our response to the goodness and the blessing of God is always an important question. The prophet Micah answers that question in our Haftarah, and we must heed what he says on God's behalf. He says, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from a life of slavery. I sent Moshe, Aharon, and Miriam to lead you. My people, just remember what Balak, the king of Moab, had planned, what Bilam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened between Shittim and Gilgal, so that you will understand the saving deeds of Adonai. With what can I come before Adonai to bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings and calves in their first year? Would Adonai take delight in thousands of rams with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Could I give my firstborn to pay for my crimes, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Human beings. You have already been told what is good, what Adonai demands of you, no more than to act justly, 
to love grace and walk in purity with your God. Adonai demands that we act justly. He demands that we love grace or mercy. He demands that we walk in purity before our God. This is our right response, and this is our responsibility. May we all learn what it means to live up to it. Amen. Father, thank you for your extraordinary word. The prophecies of Balaam here in chapter 22, 23, 24 of Numbers are astounding. And what you build on them later is even more astounding. Prophesying centuries before that your Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, for example. What can we say to you for such kindness, such greatness, such awesome wonder? You've told us what to say. It's something that we have to say with our lives. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. You've given us every reason to do this. Help us to respond rightly. We ask in Messiah's name. Amen. And Shabbat Shalom, my friends.